Hi everyone, uh, welcome to this session. Uh, my name is Hussein, and in this session, I'm going to provide lots of information about the multi tenants environment, how we create it, how we manage it. So, uh, this is just a warning that you will see lots of information technologies here. Uh, on the other hand, it is a curated list of the Kubernetes and the microservice. Um, experiences. So I really encourage you. If you have, if you're interested, you can take notes about the technologies because you will see lots of things here. So about me, uh, currently uh, we are implementing the Hazelcast Cloud. I'm uh, working as a tech lead inside the Hazelcast company. Uh, basically, what you will see in this session is the um, uh, aggregated data that I experienced in the Sony and eBay while they they are microservice and DevOps transition phases. Uh, so here is our overview, and basically uh, we will see two topics here, one for Kubernetes and another for the microservice architecture. Um, most probably most of you already know about the Kubernetes, so it is an open source platform that you can uh, do a container orchestration by forgetting any kind of infra level things, right? Um, in order to use it, you can use different kind of technologies. If you are in a cloud environment, you can use managed services, Azure, Google, or GCP. But if you are in an on-premise environment, uh, you can use also technologies like KubeSpray, uh, which is using Ansible on the background uh, to install Kubernetes on the uh, pre-provided hosts, uh, as a simple uh, example. So let's say that uh, you have a Kubernetes and you somehow installed on cloud or on-premise environment. And the second thing comes here, um, when you use Kubernetes, actually you will forget about the infra-level things. So you, you will not care about how load balancer works or how the um, EBS or some kind of data volumes maps inside the system. Um, in your company, for a specific case, let's say that you have different kind of environment, dev, staging, and prod. In order to set up this kind of environment, you, you, you can use two basic uh, flows. The f in the first one, uh, you can create a separate clusters, cluster one, two, and three for each environment, and you need to manage all of these clusters separately, right? This will be totally isolated. But in the second options, you can create a giant a Kubernetes cluster, and in this cluster, you can set up different kind of namespaces for different purposes. Um, this will be maybe easy to manage, but you need, you need to think about some security and isolation stuff. And uh, if you are using one Kubernetes cluster or the separate one, uh, the popularity I saw during my consultancy time that everything is deployed in default namespace, so the customers is not using specific namespace during their deployments. And at the end of the day, you will see there will be lots of deployments pods inside the default namespace. So we need to somehow do not use this kind of bad practice. <clears throat> we said that you can use dedicated namespaces. For example, uh, within your project, you may have the monitoring microservice and worker namespace. So what are they actually? You can put monitoring technologies inside the monitoring namespace. It can be Prometheus, Grafana, etc. Or you can put your application level things inside the microservice namespace. And uh, for example, if you have cron jobs or something like that, you can put them inside the worker namespace. So we are separating this one as logical items because um, again, at the end of the day, you may need to provide different quotas to different namespaces. So that is the main reason. And um, again, if you are handling the Kubernetes clusters, you need to have these good tools. So when you search for the kube context, you will see there is two binaries inside this project. You can find it on GitHub. Kube context basically for uh, switching from one Kubernetes cluster to another one. So context means the Kubernetes cluster. As you can see here, I can switch to uh, test coffee context and then list everything there. And Kubernetes is for handling the namespace related stuff. So you can you are in default namespace and you switch to the another one, just list the pods. Uh, very e handy tool, by the way. So you have a Kubernetes cluster. You know how to isolate them. I mean, it can be separate or the one giant cluster. Now it comes to multi-tenant environment, especially if you are developing a 
SaaS product, you need to think this one as much as possible because in multi-tenancy, it is actually providing the same resources, providing same architecture to different customers, but somehow you need to isolate these resources, right? The main tier term here is the one Kubernetes cluster, and then different namespaces for each cluster. The, the um, very basic flow. In order to have a multi-tenant environment, you can use different approaches. The first one can be the native Kubernetes way, or you can use uh, heavily the applications in order to restrict your customers to, to do some extra stuff. Um, let's say that you don't need to invest much more inside the coding part. You can use native Kubernetes to provide this multi-tenant environment, but how? Um, beside these basic objects in Kubernetes, like deployments, pod services, there is another extra information like resource quota. So what is this actually? In most of the recent Kubernetes cluster, uh, this is by default enabled, but if it is not enabled, you can provide dash enable admission plugin resource quota, as you see on the screen, uh, to your API server, servers, uh, server, I mean inside the Kubernetes cluster, to enable it. And network policies. So resource quotas are basically for restricting your customers. Here, for example, uh, if we say that customer is equal to namespace, here customer, some number, is mapped to one of your customers. This is the namespace. And under this namespace, there can be pods, services, even persisted volume claims, right? So how, to, how do you restrict your customer to have a specific amount of resources? So, According to subscription, maybe you need to set up a couple of configuration for your resource quota. Uh, in order to put some quota to a specific namespace, you can define your object like this. So here I am saying that this resource quota is defined inside the namespace that I previously showed you. And when you apply this one, you will see that you can create only one persistent volume claim, or you can define three load balancer at most. And you cannot define any kind of node parts because it is not valid for my use case and the others. So when you apply this, and if you, if you reach the limit, you will see that you will get a message saying that, okay, you cannot create more than, uh, for example, one persistent volume claim because there is a restricted quota there. Maybe according to this message, you can um, warn your customer saying that, okay, please, upgrade your subscription to have more resources on your system. This is for resource related, right? You can restrict resources, but what about the uh, network part? Network policy is important because when you have a look at this example, by the way, network policy is a uh, base abstraction inside the, inside the Kubernetes cluster, but um, you need to first check your CNI plugin. CNI is the network uh, provider for the Kubernetes clusters, you need to check CNI uh, plugin to see if it is supported your required property. For example, if you are doing IP whitelisting, uh, you need to check your CNI plugin first. Um, here I am saying that uh, in the namespace C123, um, there will be only one incoming connection comes from the monitoring namespace. So you have lots of namespaces, and inside these namespaces, there are lots of pods, and any pod can, cannot connect to another pod in another namespace. The only allowed one is the monitoring. But when you have a look at this definition, could, can you say something to me why there is this kind of definition here? What can be the possible reason to do that? No, no, why there is only one uh, connection here comes from only the monitoring namespace. So inside the system, there are lots of hundreds of pods in different namespaces, and I only allow this monitoring namespace. Okay, so um, you have a multi-tenant environment, you have lots of customers, lots of pods, namespaces, and I have a central monitoring namespace, and inside this one, there are lots of custom monitoring tools. So maybe I implement a custom exporter to monitor all of these customer pods, right? That is the main reason, because this monitoring namespace is a lot to system, system-related one. And this one, let's say that you installed your Kubernetes environment inside AWS, and when you have a look at this IP, what is this? 
Is there anyone know this IP address? Yeah, super, exactly. Let's say that you create a namespace for customer and inside that pod, customer pod, they can connect to metadata API by default, which is very dangerous because it can grab, the customer can grab any kind of metadata. So here I am saying that from this pod, let's say that I am providing Hazelcast to customer as a service and uh, a customer can write, a, for example, enter processor to get data from metadata API and save it to the cache. And in the future, I can read that data. So I get the information from the system, the entire Hezekiah's cloud, which is very bad, right? Here, I am saying that from the pod, you can access to any other public resources. You can connect to Google or you can connect any kind of API, except this metadata API, because you are not allowed to access this one. Okay, so here you can create network policies or you can create some resource quotas in order to, to do this in Kubernetes way. So as you can see, there is no much uh, programming like this stuff here. But in the second approach, we said that there can be a programmatic approach, right? In here, mostly you have a control plane and the data plane. If you are uh, pro implementing a SaaS service, um, the, the first one is for managing your environment mostly microservices or other gRPC services. And in the data plane, uh, this is the service that you provide it to customer. It can be MySQL, Hazelcast, and other stuff to provide it to customer. And this data plane is only accessible by the control plane. Why? Because I am managing my Kubernetes environment by using some client, right? It can be Java client for Kubernetes or Golang client, etc. So, um, we have Kubernetes cluster installed somewhere, so we know how to isolate it. For the multi-tenancy, I set up a couple of configurations, the basic ones. But let's say that your system is growing, how you are monitoring that? Because if you have a giant system and you don't know what's going on internally, so you, you need to, you, most probably you will have a problem because you don't know what's going on. You need to set up a successful monitoring system. When you search for monitoring in Kubernetes, most probably you will face this diagram. This is the very basic diagram of the monitoring uh, handled by Prometheus and its sites components. Uh, when you look at this diagram, you will see Prometheus, some exporters, alert managers, push gateways, etc. And Prometheus is the um, de facto monitoring mon metric collection tool in the Kubernetes world. Of course, you can use this technology in on-premise, but mostly you see this one in Kubernetes world. In order to install Prometheus in your system, you can use Prometheus operator. By the way, um, to install something in Kubernetes environment, you can use just basic kubectl commands, or you can use Helm chart installation, or you can use operators. Operators is for combining a couple of technologies in one place as a bundle. In our case, Prometheus, Grafana, they are bundled. And you can install them by using uh, Prometheus operator. When you, say, um, when you say Helm install Prometheus operator, you will see that it will install Prometheus, all the necessary resources, and then plus it will install your Grafana, predefined one. So we install this technology, it starts to collect something by default, your Kubernetes pods, um, your uh, volumes, services, etc. But what about visualization? For the visualization, you can use Grafana. As I said, um, uh, Prom Prometheus operator comes from with Grafana. It installed Prometheus and it installed Grafana and it adds the installed Prometheus to Grafana as a source. Anyone used here Grafana before? Cool, very cool. So, uh, if you install this one from scratch, you need to add this dashboard manually, right? So Prometheus operator does this one for you. This is a basic dashboard for your Kubernetes environment, and you can see the disk usage, memory reserve, cluster CPU usage, and also you can see the uh, mem uh, resource usage per namespace, you can see the replica accounts and the, some historical data. And according to this information, uh, you need to set up a couple of alarms to notify yourself, for example, for disk, memory, and other stuff. 
Um, you, you, you have microservices, right? For, uh, for example, you have Java Spring Boot microservices. You may need to have a look at some application inside because they are also imp important. When you have a look at here, we have a billing service and it is up for six weeks. And you can see another insights about this one. You can see the I.O. overview. Also, in another example, you can see the JVM insights, memory. And when you have a look at the final one here, you can see the garbage collection activity. So where these dashboards come from? Normally, there is a community page for the Grafana. You can search any kind of dashboard there. So just go to the Grafana community dashboard, search for anything, and try to install it on your Grafana dashboard. But in order to populate this graph, you need to collect this one first by using Prometheus, right? Because there should be a metric. Prometheus can collect this JVM insights, but you need to export that insights within your application. If you are using Spring Boot application, just an example, you can use micrometer in order to expose this, your application insights to the outside. You already know, for example, Spring Boot actuator. There are lots of information there. So micrometer is for exposing this information to the outside, including JVM insight, connection pools, etc. Since you expose this one to outside, Prometheus will be able to collect this information from your endpoint. This is a simple alarm configuration. Since you are in a multi-tenant environment again, you need to keep your resources very well. Otherwise, you will go into problem most probably. Here, I am saying that since I have all the information, right? It can be disk, memory usage, etc. When you have a look at here, it can be a bit complex, but I just wanted to show you that I am aggregating data for one minute, every one minute, and saying that if there is any cluster that idle for last 60 hours, just send an alarm. Very simple. So think about Heroku, for example. If you have an idle um, a dyno for 45 minutes, it will be automatically slapped, right? Here, we are trying to close our clusters by using these metrics. And of course, providing this alarm only is not a useful thing, but uh, you need to uh, send this notification to some resources. So th there is another extra configuration for this. You can define your destination. It can be email, it can be uh, something like Opsgeny, or it can even be an endpoint. For example, in our architecture, we have event service. Basically, if there is an alarm triggered from here, we are calling our microservices to collect this one and produce an action. For example, if there is an idle cluster, we try to stop this cluster first and send an email to the customer saying that, okay, there was an idle cluster, we just stopped it, but you can resume it in the future. But just to warn user. Or even you can send it to Slack to have a proactive environment. So uh, we installed this one in one cluster, right? Let's say that you have multiple Kubernetes cluster, it can be. Yeah, so you, you may have your operation in different regions, right? According to your customers. So Will you install this Prometheus to every place and this Grafana dashboard to every cluster? And in order to check them separately, you need to go Grafana dashboard one by one and check everything? Or is there any other useful way to do this? So since I am saying this one, of course, there is another way. You can search for the Prometheus Federation. This is basically something you already have multiple cluster and you choose one cluster for a central Prometheus or you can install another central Kubernetes cluster to install only the Prometheus-like things. Here, I am saying that I have three other Kubernetes clusters, and within this current Prometheus, I am saying that just collect every information from other clusters and save it to your local Prometheus DB. So it will do this for every 15 seconds. You have only one central Prometheus, and when you open it, you will see every information comes from the different Kubernetes clusters. Yeah, do you think is that cool or complex? Okay. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. We collect lots of things and when you have a look at the final product, you will see we have um, Hazelcase Kubernetes, Hazelcase cluster. And what you see in the dashboard all comes from the Prometheus because we collect everything for the customer from the Prometheus. 
Now I am able to fetch every data, aggregate lots of data from Prometheus. So until this part, we were in a black box. That means you cannot access this system from the outside. So how to expose this system to the outside? Uh, in this section, we will mention about a cloud-based scenario. Let's say that you are inside AWS. Um, in order to expose your application to the outside, you need to create a service, right, in Kubernetes world. When you do a service, you need to provide a type. It can be node port, cluster IP, none, or load balancer. If, by default, if, uh, if you are a new learner of Kubernetes, most probably you will use load balancer. And every service will create a separate load balancer. And if you have 100 microservices, you will see you will have 100 load balancer. And at the end of the year, you may need to close your company due to lots of bills, right? Instead of doing that, we, you can use Nginx Ingress. So when you use Nginx Ingress, basically you install this one inside your Kubernetes cluster, and there will be a you can think about a simple Nginx web server, and it will create a load balancer for you, and there will be only one. And when you try to expose your service to the outside, you will create service again, but it will not be a load balancer. It can be a node port or a cluster IP. So whenever you expose a service, basically it will create a reverse proxy entry inside the Nginx web server configuration. That is very simple. So you have services, you have Nginx Ingress that created a load balancer on AWS, but what about the domain part? You can use different kind of technologies. You can use Cloudflare, Route 53, but let's say that you used Route 53. The only thing you need to do is just define a C name, pointing your only one load balancer. You example.com, it will point to the load balancer that's created by Nginx Ingress. And according to your context path, it will redirect to specific service. And this redirection is handled by ingress rules. Uh, within this example, you will see if you make a request by example.com and you pro provide the products slash product context, uh, it will be proxy to the product service, the service name, and it will use the 8080 port at the backend side. And as a general overview, the first request comes to your root 53, and it is pointed to load balancer as a CNAME record. And actually, by using the Nginx ingress rules, it redirects to product service or the user service. So uh, we have a ready Kubernetes environment right now. It is exposed to outside. No problem under this part. So how we handle this? Uh, think about five years ago or something like that. We have giant monolithic application, and in order to deploy something to production environment, you need to wait for a while. It can be something like one hour maybe. You just changed the product page title, and you need to wait for 45 minutes for one instance. I faced this kind of products uh, in real life, but let's say that you switch to microservice architecture, right? Anyone here still using monolithic application? Okay, microservice, cool. Use microservice and switch back to monolith one. <laughs> okay, so uh, the first microservice switchers. When you switch the microservice architecture, most probably you will get this one, right? You try to distribute lots of memory to lots of your services because uh, when you decompose your service, you may have at least 15 or something like that and just provide one CPU per each and a Believe me, in cloud environment, uh, if you have 15 microservices and if you provide one CPU per each, you will get the reasonable bill at the end of the month. So uh, in order to prevent this situation, we need to relay a couple of base, best practices. So the microservice architecture term cannot solve your architectural problems. Um, microservices are like humans, so there should be a communication and they need to use a proper language to communicate each other. I will mention about the REST here. You can also use uh, gRPC, but uh, in terms of REST, uh, you can think about this Leonard Richardson maturity model. There are four levels here. The first level is something like SOAP services. There is only uh, one endpoint, and you define your action within the request body in envelope. And in resources, you have different endpoints this time, but you are using same HTTP methods for everything. So you are using get method 
to create something, list something, delete something, or some update something. In level two, HTTP verbs. This time, you are using different HTTP methods. For example, post for creating, get for getting data, patch for partial update, put for replace some resource. In, by the way, level two is also good for nowadays. And in level three, hypermeter control, this time, you are returning some extra embedded links inside your API response. You can check GitHub REST APIs. So when you use the latest one, actually, let's say that you have a REST API and it is consumed by web applications, mobile applications, etc. When you have a look at the user profile, you will see some other extra links like user blog posts, maybe user comments, user likes, etc. Since you have embedded ready links, you can just go grab that link and go to the destination page. Or the good example is the navigational links, right? The previous link and the next link, etc. So you don't need to add extra implementation on your web or mobile application to generate some links. Uh, you have microservices, and in order to interact between each other, um, you need to use some HTTP clients, right? You can use pure HTTP client connections, or you can use another strategy. It can be a Fain client. Maybe you have heard about the Fain client. In Fain client, you just simply define an interface, an interface method inside it, and it will act like a real um, client code for you. For example, here, um, when you make a call this function get user, it will call the user's service. This user's actually the service name inside the Kubernetes. And then it will use the user's pad inside the, uh, right after the service name. And of course, since you define the user ID, you can uh, get this user by, by, get user information by ID. But if you think about the second option, it can be something like Swagger. So when, you, when I define this bin inside Java application, Spring Boot application, actually at the end of the day, I will have two extra links right after this bin definition. The first one will be the Swagger documentation. Most, most probably all of you heard about this one. And the second one will be your API spec. So there's another library which is called Swagger Code Gen CLI. So within this jar file, you can provide your API spec URL, which is the second URL, and define your language saying that, okay, I need a client library, client generated code for the spring. You can use JavaScript or you can use PHP, etc. And just generate this client library to this path folder. So you, let me provide a good example on the real uh, life scenario. Let's say that you just implemented a feature, experimental feature. When you deploy this feature to your non-prod environment, you can trigger another Jenkins job right after deployment to generate the client code of this newly implemented feature and tag it by snapshot and put it to the Nexus Artifactory. So if you are subscribed to some snapshot uh, central repository, you will get it right away with, to test the new features. But uh, for the production one, of course, you need to have a stable one. Uh, right after deployment, you just generate, trigger another Jenkins job to generate client code for your newly deployed service. So there will be zero implementation for the client part. We have microservices, but what about the adoption to the Kubernetes environment? Here, um, this is a simple Golang project. We, have, we are working as a Polygot programmer. Um, when you have a look at this project architecture, you will see some business logic inside the application folder. And there is some Kubernetes related files, deployment and services, and some extra SH files, Jenkins files, and Docker file. When you open the deployment YAML, you will see, okay, what is this? Uh, I have a image URL, right? Because I already built this image by using Jenkins and I have ready Docker image. And my service name is uh, the event service. And also I said that replicas tree. So there will be three instances, there will be three pods when I deploy, create this deployment. And also there is some static environment variables. When you check the service, you will see this, this service, when you create this service, it will expose your deployment to the outside by using this information. So how the 
public request and this deployment mapped each other. So they all handled by tags. When you have a look at this uh, selector at the end in the service, you will see app is equal to event app. So when you make a request to this service, actually it will match with the deployment that has a label is equal to app event app. So I assume that you already configured your kubectl client, and then uh, you execute this command inside your Jenkins. In order to deploy this one, you just clone your project. You can use Jenkins for a pipeline configuration. Go into your project folder and just say kubectl apply dash f and Kubernetes. So this Kubernetes is the folder of my Kubernetes related files. So what about the confidential data? You just put this one as a static inside the environment, or you can define something like this. I assume that you already created a secret by using your password. So here, the password comes from most probably your Jenkins credentials, or if you are using Vault or something like that, it will be pre-configured before your deployment. And um, here, the first value is static, bring that data source username, so my user, visible. But when you have a look at the second one, you will see the value comes from a secret. The secret is, comes from the product service vault or name, and the key is the DB password, which is created in the first section here. <clears throat> so uh, we are able to deploy our application to a Kubernetes environment, but what about deployment strategies? Um, let's say that you push your changes to Git repository, and then uh, this is... Um, this triggered a Jenkins job, and in a simple Jenkins job, you build, test, and deploy your code to a simple Kubernetes environment, right? Um, when you have a look at this um, example, this is a Jenkins pipeline. Uh, I clone my project. I try to test, build, test, and try to deploy this one to the Kubernetes environment. And if there is a success, you will directly see this one in Slack, because when you, again, have a look at this one, you will see notify Slack started. So you can do a Jenkins Slack integration to have this kind of notifications right away. So otherwise, when you deploy something and there, there is a failure, you will never know that, even you manually open and see your Jenkins uh, job list. And inside, inside the project structure, you saw the base script file. As here's, I simply built my image I tag it and push it to a Docker registry, the basic, the private one. You can use the internal Docker registry, you can use JFrog, or you can use managed one, uh, Quai.io or Docker private, Docker Hub private, etc. And then apply my Kubernetes configurations right away. It was a simple one, and by default, it uses rolling update. What does it mean? You have an application in Kubernetes environment, when you deploy a new one, and if you have a three replicas there, you will see that it will try to deploy your pods one by one, but according to your rolling update definition. Uh, but the, the, the second scenario is the Canary deployment. So let me try to provide you an example about Canary deployment. In production environment, I have a version which is one, Docker image is one, and I have three replicas. Recently, I decided that, okay, if I implement this feature, I will make another extra profit, so let's try to do this. I implemented new feature, and as you can see here, the replicas is one, the Docker image is different, version is different, and the, another different thing here is, as you can see, the first one has a name prod app, then the second name is the canary app. So I have two deployments, they are nearly same, but the only difference is the replicas and the Docker images. So think about the service right in front of these deployments. When the first request comes here, you will see that the request will go to both deployments. But why? We have two deployments. We have one service in front of them. Why the incoming request uh, will be able to go to different deployments? Anyone can explain this part. Huh? Yeah, they have same selectors here. So since they have a ratio 3-1, the 25% of the request will go to the second one, which is the canary experimental one. 
75% will go to the production uh, stable one. But after a while, you need to increase this proportion to have the experimental as a stable version. So let's say that you track your monitoring tools, logging tools, and say that, okay, there is no real uh, critical exception, so I need to increase, increase this iteratively. And after a while, you need to have this one. So my Docker image is changed, the replica is three, and you see the deployment prod app is the, uh, new, has the new Docker image version. In the blue-green deployment, this is a bit expensive when you compare the others because you need to have exact duplicated environment to have blue-green. So you have a production environment, and if you have an experimental one, you need to deploy this one as an exact duplicate. And then let's say that you tested this one internally and provide this link to some special customers. And let's say that you have no exceptions, and then you can switch your request to the another one and this blue air green always changes between each other on every release so logging this is a very basic spring boot uh, application output log and most probably you have different kind of application you need to have this you need to see these logs in a central place right in Kubernetes, basically, you have three types of logging, the node-level logging and cluster-level logging. In node-level logging, most probably, you have an agent inside the uh, node, and your, your logs is uh, periodically rotated in a system. So this can be the first option. But in the second option, you have, again, a daemon set. So this daemon set collects every log from your container output logs, and we'll try to send this one to a central log management tool. So let me say you the stack. You have a fluent bit, and fluent bit grabs all the logs from your container output. And then this fluent bit send this request to local log stash tool. And this log stash is capable for buffering your logs and send them to a central log management tool according to configuration. Or it can even do a filtering right before the sending logs. Um, so you can use different kind of technologies for this. Uh, Logstash here is important because let's say that you are trying to provide your system log to the, your customers, but you may want to provide only the application level logs, something like if you are providing Hazelcast as a service, you may need to set only Hazelcast related logs, not the Kubernetes related logs, because otherwise you may send the, some other customer's confidential data to the, another customer, which is a very bad situation. So the filtering can be handled inside Fluentbit or the Logstash part. Uh, in our case, we are using Humio, by the way. You can just go and use this cloud-based uh, solution. Um, basically, when you create an account, you will get this uh, screen. You will, have, you will be provided with a um, uh, Kubernetes configuration. And when you do a Helm install by using this Humio agent YAML, that's all. So, since you installed this agent to your Kubernetes environment, it will grab and send every log to your Humio dashboard. Very simple. So you have lots of application. You are monitoring it. You have beautiful graphs. You have loggings. But sometimes you may need some advanced insight about your application. And APM and Service Mesh comes into this part. And uh, in order to do a service mesh or some application level insight, you may use different kind of open source tools like Nivrelic, AppDynamics, Dynatrace, and Zipkin. You can use any kind of them. But according to me, my personal, um, personal feeling about, for example, Nivrelic, AppDynamics, and Dynatrace, they are, according to me, they are like, they are, they are old. They have very good experience on this. But when it comes to containerization world, they are a bit. Um, older than the new fashion one uh, about this application uh, APM tools. So um, I will try to explain this in Stana. So when you, tr when you try to install this one, as whom you I said, they have a daemon set. When you install this one into your Kubernetes environment, the first thing you will see is the, your infrastructure map. So I have a cluster, different kind of cluster on the AWS environment. And when you install daemon set, you will see lots of Kubernetes clusters. What else? You will see your service mesh about your microservices. When you have a look at this part, you will see which service make a request to another service, the general, general map of, of your entire ecosystem. And what else? Here, I saw that there is an alarm on system. So there is a problem in the shop service. 
I open my dashboard on the Instana, and then I see that there is a latency on get shop request. When you deep drill down in the request, you will see there is an HTTP call. Okay, there is a when, when you make a shop request, you will see it will call another request, which is product search. Most probably, it is getting data from the product search endpoint, and it will call Elasticsearch. And you see there is a problem in Elasticsearch. Most probably, you are trying to make a search in an unindexed field. So you can see the drill down here, and. Um, you can try to find the root cause of the problems in production environment in very short time. And also, if you have a web application, you can also integrate this one to your web application to see whole flow it comes from the front end part and it combines with your microservices. If you want, this system is also automatically create incidents and you can bind this one to Ops Jenny in order to alarm you if you're an on-call system. You will be notified on your phone and then you can check what's going on in your system. Yeah, that's all. Uh, if you have any kind of question, I can happily answer them. Yeah. Uh, hello, thank you for your... Hello. Uh, thanks for your um, presentation. Um, on one of the first slides, you've shown the Grafana interface. Uh, is that dashboard available somewhere? If you install a Prometheus operator by default, you will see that it will provide you a section. Let me show you real example. When you install Prometheus operator, you will see. Uh, okay. Okay, most probably I will not be able to show. So, uh, when you install Prometheus operator, um, you will see some predefined dashboards. Mm -hmm. the, what you see there is the clusters dashboard comes from the Prometheus operator. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. One on the backend side. Uh, what is the best way to expose uh, like uh, environments to the outside? For instance, like uh, you said, you have a uh, couple of customers and uh, all uh, they have uh, the application copies deployed to the same Kubernetes cluster and I want to provide each of uh, uh, customers, let's say, uh, to give them ability to use their own domain. Or, or use like company one dot .com, company two dot what how to do how to uh, what's the best way to achieve this? Mm -hmm. Okay, so normally we do not provide a domain like this because um, so the first way can be you can define a unique port for each customer. For example, in our case, we have a fixed amount of Kubernetes nodes. It is something like twenty, for example, and for every customer, let's say that you created something. Uh, you can create a unique port for every customer. But what about the domain part? In our case, we are not using domain because it introduced extra latency for the DNS check. But if you still want to do this one, you can use some DNS, you can add a DNS record to your system. If you are using root 53, you can add another subdomain and map it to the certain path by using your service name. So you have an IP, you have a port, and you can make a alias, domain alias to your, uh, for your customer. Why uh, hello? Yeah, why Swagger 2? I mean, in your demo, you shown Swagger 2. It's kind of uh, old, outdated. Why not? Uh, yeah, you can use the, yeah, you can use the updated one. By the way, there is Swagger Swagger 2, etc. Uh, when when there is a new release, I am not a, I am not doing a certain really quick update on this because I know that it is stable. So I um, resisting on using the stable fund. At least there should be something like one year to use the new one. But that is uh, just an example. Open API spec specifications uh, three zero something. It's considered stable uh -huh. at the moment. But uh, you also shown like 
you can dynamically generate clients based on your uh, uh, Swagger uh, schema. Mm -hmm. But though the quality of those clients is really low. They are not really usable and they don't really make the life of your developers, uh, of your target developers, tar target audience uh, easier because mm -hmm. you really cannot control, well, you can control how they generate it, but the, generally the quality is pretty much... Yeah, there is some auto-generated code. When you have a look at the code, you can see that, okay, it is not used the best practice. But it is just a choice. For example, we are using, we are developing our own internal client to do that, but it is just a choice. So you, it can be internal client, you just write it. But as a first start, maybe you can use Swagger to make it faster. And after a while, you can write your own wrapper or you can remove it by using your own internal client. Or if you have chance, you can use Fain client. Yeah, uh, because I I in our uh, new uh, platform, actually, we don't have a predefined schema. We don't have the resources uh, hmm. statically. They're being uh, provisioned. They're being uh, created on demand per tenant. So huh. we don't know how the tenant would look like, the end tenant would look like. <laughs> so we are kind of taking a different uh, approach onto that. But also, uh, I wanted to ask you about uh, the uh, tenant isolation. Mm -hmm. uh, you showed a two approaches uh, 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 based on environments and segmentation. So you have uh, prod, uh, QA, and mm -hmm. development environments, and they basically your three clusters. So that I can sell to our security officer. But you say there is a different approach, and you basically run your single cluster, and you segment it by namespaces. Uh -huh. So that would be a really tough sell point to a security officer because they, they, they wouldn't buy it simply. How, how can you convince a security officer that it's really a, you can guarantee tenant isolation and you cannot really impact your development uh, work cannot impact the effect, the whole cluster. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So uh, let's say that you have one cluster and you have different namespaces. The first thing you need to do is you can simply define a network policy to completely isolate from post to another. And let's say that you have different kind of profiles. Let's say that you have developers and they have teams, etc. right? And you can also use the, these RBAC rules in order to define this. So when you say that you, as a developer, your profile is only accessible to this namespace. When you, when you do this, actually you can only see or do something on your specific namespace, and that's all. But when you jump into your namespace, maybe you may need, you, you, you can make the request to another namespace, but it is also disallowed because there is a network policy. So um, if there is a concern on the security part, we are providing this solution to the outside, and every company does this one because you need to decrease the cost, right? So we have one cluster, uh, this cluster is shared among all the customers. So this is already doable. So we are applying the same rule to our internal company, which is very good. But again, there is another thing. Somebody from the company should take a responsibility for doing this and uh, di distribute this knowledge among these uh, other developers. Yeah. Thank you for your talk. Um, I have a question for a de 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 DevOps expert. Um, let's assume uh, we have a QA environment uh -huh. and um, there are a lot of microservices. All uh, those are dockerized. Mm -hmm. And um, um, we have um, QA tests, functional uh -huh. and performance tests. Yeah. Uh, at the same time. So what is the best practice uh, for the, uh, to isolate those environments? Should we build um, the whole environment uh, for the performance test? Mm -hmm. And then we can uh, start an another environment to another uh, performance test. And the same for QA, or should we have uh, isolated uh, environments on demand. Uh -huh. Okay, let me try to explain. You have two choices here. 
Uh, you can both use different Kubernetes cluster, but you shouldn't do this one manually. You can uh, implement a Terraform a plan for you. So uh, you can create any kind of environment for your use case, for example, QA test. Before the QA test, you can just spin up a Kubernetes cluster by using Terraform, do your test, and destroy it. So this is very normal. And if you don't want to do this, you can define your QA namespace, no problem. As I mentioned in the resource quotas, you can define some more flexible quotas to your QA environment, and you can enable the auto-scaling feature inside Kubernetes. So you can create as much as pods, as much as resources as you want in the QA, and let's say that you reach the limit of Kubernetes cluster, since you enabled the auto-scaling feature, it will increase the node count. And once you finish your QA test, you will see that it will be automatically shrinked. So that you can do it in any way. Separate cluster, or the, the, if it is separate, the automation is very, very important. Infrastructure as code, if you are saying that. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, thank you all again. <laughs>